Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel or podcast, depending on however you are listening. My name is Jacob Restituto, and I'm a musician from Northport, New York. And today, we have an absolute pleasure of having Anthony J. all the way from California here with me today. Thank you so much, Anthony, for taking the time, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Thanks. it is. It's going to be cool. Nice to yeah, absolutely. So I did a little research. I You have quite the list of things that you have done in your career, and it is pretty impressive. Uh, but Thanks. for the people that are not familiar with who you are, can you kind of give a little backstory uh, you know, uh, you in the music industry, and then we're going to go sure. even further into how you got into the music industry. Sure. I mean, um, I guess, you know, I always hate like, you know, blowing my own horn. So it's like, I, I always, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've got a Spotify playlist, which I could share with you. It's yeah. got about, it's got about 500 tracks, 40 hours straight of music that I've written, produced and mixed and stuff. That and it's cool. like, it's pretty crazy. So people use it for road trips and stuff like that. That's you know, so it, cool. It, um, and I'd love to share that. And, you know, I, I post every day on my Instagram, which is like I'm always showing people, you know, the, the gear and the tools that I use and how to just exper I'm very experimental by nature. And that's sort of where I came from. I grew up, you know, kind of into like Frank Zappa and Genesis and Yes and prog rock and, and jazz and all that stuff. So it's like, I, you know, and then I, I slowly turned it into it's a kind of a really long story. But I started off programming a, a Lynn drum machine, which mm. was in the in the mid 80s that was like replacing all the drummers so all the drummers were running around furious and then i'm like hmm if i get a lindrum then i can you know i can just start programming it you know and that, that was that was my beginning um you know and then you know you flash forward like 10 or 15 years and i'm i'm in london working with duran duran um sitting with prince and simon lebon talking about the Lynn drum machine at the brit music awards i think it was 97 so just i mean it's like there's so much in between that, like sleeping under a grand piano for six years, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, it's, it's a convoluted, long involved story, but I'm here to, you know, answer your questions. And I love it. I appreciate you taking the time, man. I very no much appreciate it. So yes, that is the perfect segue into, into the, the next topic is I, I want to hear some of those stories from all the way from hanging out with Prince in the, at the Brits, but also from sleeping under the piano because people, often we'll see that top of the mountain moment without seeing, you know, the hours of preparation to climb Mount Everest, not only before you even get to Mount Everest to climb it, you have this preparation before you even get there. Right. So I'd love to hear some so of both true. aspects of the story. Sure. Like I, you know, I, I started off working at a recording studio down in Hanson mass, which is kind of towards Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. um, and they were super nice people, Fred and Pat Danner. They had a studio there and a pretty well-known engineer was Bob St. John. He's pretty well known for stuff he did with, you know, he's got a bunch of Grammys and stuff, but he back then we were just all starting out. Um, uh, Extreme, Extreme was recording demos there. They were like in their, they were teenagers, you know. And so that's that's where it all started. And and basically they let me, it was about a two hour drive to where I lived. So they would let me stay there during the week when we were recording. And wow. I made a little, I made a little apartment underneath the grand piano. It had this black cover and I, I, yeah. I had my, my bed under there and I had a little alarm clock radio and, you know, you know, it's just so, so that was like my pad and it was completely black dark in there like because there was no windows so you you never knew you know when you you would wake up to the sound of a band coming through the door with big dunkin donuts coffees you know and you'd be like oh god here we go <laughs> oh man well, first of all the hysterical part about that is i mean first of all the fact that you slept under the piano but the hysterical um cultural thing that you just referenced that only people in the northeast would understand is that like massachusetts is the dunkin donuts <laughs> <laughs> they, they just they started hitting la there's one in santa monica and there's one actually on my way to work in Encino. yeah absolutely well but they're they're all over so i'm from new york long island actually and they're yeah. all over but like like it, dunkin donuts is a religion in the northeast it, it's oh, yeah. so funny how that that, that that you just referenced that cultural aspect but i i love that man i love the story of that because you have some like you said even in the brief intro which i kind of want you to blow a little more smoke because yeah. like i'm giving you the opportunity <laughs> but <laughs> you've worked with some really cool names like you just said you were speaking with El um sorry um prince and duran duran but you've also worked with uh, ellen john you've also worked on one of my favorite movies uh with which would be twilight uh so really cool stuff but it all kind of starts from you sleeping under a piano and people sure. don't People see all the accolades and want all the accolades, but you know you also got to be willing to put in the six years of sleeping under a piano. You know, yeah, just countless hours for very little money, all that. Mm. You know, that's part of part of part of the journey. Um, I, I yeah, that's exactly. I mean, um, 
you know, but I, those were wonderful times. I have great memories of that. Couldn't you know? agree more. If you no. love it and you have that, like, the, see, the, that's the, that's a great point because if you love what you do and you're loving the process, the fact that you're even in the studio, you're you're pumped to be there. Exactly, it, and it's like it's one of these things that if you have that gene, you have no choice. It's what you, <laughs> it's, it's just what you do. You know, it's like I, I I worked at another studio before that, just getting coffee and sandwiches and and um that's where my my first uh, i i ran into vinnie vincent from the group kiss at the time was working on his first solo album wow and that was even before that and that was like being a runner which is like the lowest you know but it's like you got to start somewhere you know yeah. and and really in in the studio you know business that's really there's really no shortcut you know most people start as an, a runner then they become a, an assistant and then they start engineering and you know what I mean? There's I don't know of any shortcuts. I mean, there are people that get lucky along the way and suddenly they have like a top 10 album yeah. Um, yeah. out of nowhere. But it, it's not it's definitely not the uh, it's the exception, not the rule. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a very similar story, actually. The way I found you was through uh, Jer uh, Jeremy Inheber. I don't know if you guys okay. know. Do you sure, know I know Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We, yeah. We, uh, we, we're in both in L.A. and we're both from back east. Yes. So we, we've connected uh there's a coffee shop about half a mile from the studio is where jim morrison from the doors used to hang out it's, it's uh, called the uh, laurel canyon country store and it's it looks like 1967 there oh uh, that's, that's wild what, we met there for coffee yeah that, i love i'm in laurel canyon which is just like you know the, i don't know if you know any of the musical history of laurel canyon but it's like in the 70s like everybody was up here Joni mitchell jackson brown linda ronstad the turtles the the monkeys i mean it was like a mecca that's and it's amazing. like it's all around me up here it's in in the mountains it's beautiful yeah. it's like you were in the mountains but we're like literally a half a mile to hollywood i mean it's like crazy oh that's amazing it's but cool. the reason i bring him up is because i just had him on the channel for an interview and that's actually how i i was looking through his profile and i saw you and i was like I see. but but he has a very similar story he started off in in, in his studio getting coffee and and doing you know and then he started to you know go through the ranks but it's a very similar story so uh, that's it's i love that i love i love the the common thread between all of that sure yeah, yeah for sure so you like you said very uh, early in the beginning of the conversation that you have been known for your very experimental style works um yes. is that just something that you just kind of just you just enjoy doing has it become your trademark like how did that you know that's a great question because it's, it's there's various aspects to it. Like when I think I grew up, I was definitely, you know, I didn't mention the Beatles, how much a part of my life they were before I got into prog rock as a very young kid growing up. That's what pretty much all I listened to. And my favorites were the like, you know, I am the walrus and strawberry yeah. fields. And I had no idea what all those sounds were. But, you know, later, as you start to study, you realize George Martin was and Jeff, Jeff Emmerich were using speeding, slowing down the tape and speeding it up doing things at half the speed and then you know the, so that that experimental nature i think they kind of wrote the bible of it mm -hmm. like it, almost all the techniques can be found somewhere in the beatles catalog yeah. and so that's mm -hmm. kind of where it originated and so you know I, I used to love to do things like you know flipping the tape over backwards you know you know we used to work on analog tape so you would record the the reverb and on the other side of the tape and then it would you know, flip it over and record it to another track you know all that weird stuff and and just um you know things like detuning the drums like i would play i like to play the drums uh, i play a lot of instruments but when i play drums a lot of times i'll play significantly faster than the song in very speed and then when you slow it down to the actual speed of the song i can even do this in pro tools now um all of a sudden the drums have they sound like giant rubber balls underwater or something you know so i've always been attracted to you know like experimentation you know peter gabriel's yeah. early stuff like security you know just you know i grew up listening to you know early u2 stuff you know, when they're working with, um, you know, Daniel Lanois and Flood, like all that experimentation. Um, the pop album was one of my favorites. So some of, like Flood was an amazing uh, innovator. Yeah. And Brian yeah. Eno, of course, you know, with Roxy Music. So these were my heroes. And I just kind of, I wanted to push boundaries and learn how to, to try to do something a little bit different. You know? I love that. And I am super curious now of your perspective on this, because as an artist that grew up in the 21st century, sampling has become very popular. And a lot of art, a lot of artists, maybe that have be, either been in the industry for a while, or even people like onlookers into the industry, be like, "Oh, sampling's not making music. It's just you taking other people's sounds or mus uh, music and turning it into." And I'm like, I could not have related more to what you just said, but from sampling, I'll find the drum pa sa rhythm or whatever. 
I'll pitch it down, you know, an octave. I'll speed it up twice, and it's like you manipulate. It's a totally new sound now, and it's sure. No, I agree. I, perspective. No, that, I'm. I, that's a. When I started, I mean, my very first like instrument that got me into music production was an Akai uh, sampler. It was a keyboard mm. version of the S1000, and it had two megas of RAM. That's it. And I started exploring that thing, and I did my first solo album as Ajax Rayovac. It's called Demos of Saturn on that with two megs of RAM. And when I listen to that record, I'm like, how did I do that with two megs of RAM? It's mm. amazing what you can make do when you have so little. And a lot of times you're even more creative with less tools. Um, mm. That's, you know, sometimes I actually will force myself to, to limit what I use in a, in a certain situation because a lot of times it'll make you search for something better instead of just relying on what you, you like to rely on, you know? Yeah. So that's one one thing that that no I'm with you in that and that that's where my career started um, in performance art I would recite very bizarre uh, I would recite like poetry over really strange soundscapes you know orchestral weird just crazy and I would get in front of people and I would do these like poetry slams and I'd have all these crazy sounds and I you know so I made my first album in my in a bedroom um, it took me several years um, to make it and this mm. was all the while when I was living you know under the piano back and <laughs> forth and then. So I started, I, I, I auditioned for drums uh, for the, the band called Missing Persons. They were like big in the, in the mid 80s. Um, uh, the, the drummer and the, the singer, had, they got divorced and they were looking for a new drummer. Um, so they kind of reformed with not all the original members. And I, mm -hmm. and I ended up getting that gig. So Warren Cucurulo, who left the band to join Duran Duran, that was the connection to Duran Duran. And I had this very experimental poetry album and I just sent it to him on a cassette and um he 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 him and simon lebon listened to it and, and they were like kind of freaked out at how it sounded because they were just they had been working on a record mixing a record i'm not sure which one that would have been um but anyway they weren't they weren't happy with the mixes and they said this stuff sounds incredible where did you do this wow and and so basically they said we'd like to give you a, an opportunity to mix one of our songs but don't get your hopes up our standards are super high so like but we'll send you a track and see what you do with it so I got I got spec time at a real studio and I went in there and um, I worked on a, a track for their, their thank you album. It was uh, 911 is a joke by Public Enemy, which people can't you know even fathom that. But uh, it was kind of a rock, a straight ahead rock song. And I, I, I sampled like all kinds of weird stuff, like people blowing into conch shells. I had a cowboy lady going woo, woo, through it, like all kinds of crazy stuff. And I just I just did like my performance art thing over Duran Duran because I knew that if they liked my, my, my record, that's probably what they were looking for. And, um, it ended up, they ended up lo loving it. I got it back then we had beepers and I, we had a voicemail. You, you get a voicemail on a beeper that tells yeah. you, you got a call. So it was before cell phones, even you go to the pay phone and you dial in and it was, it was silent. Simon Labad going, Anthony, you're fucking mad. You've got, <laughs> to get, got to get you over here straight away. Terrible English <laughs> accent, but Oh, um, I love yeah. that, man. And that was yeah. the beginning of it. And I ended up working on like 30 songs with them over the wow. next number of years. It was funny. I showed up to the studio with like a Mac Classic and an Akai sampler under my arm. That was all I had. And they were like, they were looking, they were, you know, looking for the truck, you know? <laughs> oh, man. I love that. And you know what, what I, I really love about that is to some degree, like, and I don't know if you experienced this, but in, in, I've been in not necessarily that similar of a situation with like that notable artist yet. But like where it's like you, you meet somebody, you work with somebody that is significantly farther in their career. And like it's super intimidating, too, because I, I don't like the insecurity comes in. It's like, oh, all I have is my Mac and my thing. And like they're expect, you know, it's like but if you your work shows for you, you just got to, you know, yeah. giddy up and be like, you know what? Be confident to some degree. Yeah. And the first thing the studio manager did was throw me the higher gear, the rental gear book. And they're like, you can rent whatever you want. Wow. You know, they were coming off a number one hit with Ordinary World. So it was like. I'm like, really? Yeah, whatever you want. And I sat down there. I, I, I ordered a drum set, a bass amp. And like, and uh, the production coordinator, coordinator called me. Her name was Colleen. I forget her last name. But she's like, Anthony, did you just order a drum set? And I go, yeah. She goes, but, but you're mixing. And I go, yeah, well, I just got a funny idea about it. <laughs> yeah, I love that, man. I love that. So that is that's such a cool story, man. And it's, it's so wild. But let's actually get, let, I want to go back slightly before that. And I sure. want to hear, like, how did you, so from, from starting with this studios that you worked with, how do you go from, you know, working at a local studio to then working with these bigger, like, where is that gap in between? 
Well, I mean, I think getting a lot of experience was necessary for me to get the skills I needed to create something yeah. that could impress somebody. I mean, if yeah. I if I had gotten that opportunity too soon, I wouldn't have had anything to, to for them to be excited about. You know what mm. I mean? So I think that was it was a long process to get me to the point. And, and doing my first solo record sort of like laid the groundwork for all these experimental things, even though I did it in a much more primitive way. Um, I used like a lot of subharmonics from like old stereo pieces from the 70s, like DBX 120 XDS, you know, and it creates like subharmonics in like toms and things. And a lot of psychoacoustic stuff with ping pong delays and just, you know, like, you know, really tight little delays like spread across to make things extra wide. Um, you know, all these things I experimented like countless hours, you know, and when they heard that mix, that's what got me in the door. And then I then I, I teamed up with Bob St. John, who's, you know, a phenomenal engineer. I'm I'm more somebody that's like finger painting. I rely on technical people to take my finger painting wow. and and kind of take it to the next level scientifically because mm-hmm. you know you got to know your limitations. And I think a lot of a lot of people today I make the mistake of thinking they have to do everything and I know we're in an era where you know the budgets are low and a lot of times you're just forced to do everything. But but a real mastering engineer and a real mix engineer will bring something to the project that is will elevate it so much further than you ever thought possible. And even somebody like Billie Eilish, you know, sure her brother is phenomenal and he did a lot of that in the bedroom, but, but Rob Kaninsky spent like weeks, like perfecting it in a real studio. Dude, that is such a funny example. Do you know, are you familiar with Chris Geringer, the mastering engineer? Oh yeah. He's phenomenal. He's, he's done hundreds of tracks for me. Oh yeah. He's done like literally everything, but it's his, his his portfolio or his uh, discography is insane. I I move around with, you know, mastering engineers. It's sort of like, it's kind of like nice to change. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, Chris is, Chris is one of the best. So I just, I just met him. I had him on the channel for an interview a couple months ago. Oh, oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. He's a super cool guy. And then he invited me over to the studio and we, I went to Sterling in Jersey. Oh, nice. And it was, we were, we got on the same topic and he said, he used the same exact example. He's like, he's like, I'm, I'm kind of sad at that. Um, while the bedroom producer is, is so popular right now, it's only a half truth. He's like, like Phineas and Billie Eilish, like they, they, they put off this, um, uh, bedroom producer vibe, which is true. But then yeah. like he's, he said the exact same thing, but then he's Phineas sends it to a mixing engineer and he's like, and that's what elevates it to sound like, you know, so, so yes. funny you use that exact analogy. That's yeah. It's, it's just kind of a, a recent one that, you know, yeah. and, and so much of what I hear, like, I, you hear so many like things with lots of potential, but they, they just, they're harsh. They're like, they're peak limited. They're, they fatigue your ears after 10 seconds. You just want to shut it off, you know? And that's because a lot of people just don't have the experience, you know? And there's certain things like clipping and all this, it, it becomes these trend words, um, you know? And it's like, yeah, sure. It's a trend word, but it hurts my ears. <laughs> yeah. No, that's <laughs> you true. Know? And you said not to sh- sound old, not to sound old and cranky. I mean, I love a lot of modern stuff. You know, I, there's so many people pushing envelopes, you know, like, and even in hip hop, it's amazing. Some of the engineers that are working in this, this space, like my James um, Hunt, who works with Kendrick. I mean, like, guys, he's, you know, we worked with him over at Encore and like, phenomenal, phenomenal, talented people, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But you so, yeah, everybody, yeah, yeah, they get the impression that they can, you know, they can do the same thing, you know, and you can, you know, you can learn and, and, and aspire to that. But it's not going to happen in a year or two years or three years 100%. or five hundred percent. You know, Absolutely. like some of these, these mastering engineers have been doing nothing but sitting between a hundred thousand dollar speakers for like longer than you've been alive. So, you know, that's that's where the art is. In that the- is such an important point. I, I couldn't agree more because you compare as an artist that's starting off myself, even have the, being in an industry for a while uh, or just like 15 years old and just starting off. You're comparing your mixes that you've been like mixing or you like producing or whatever you want to like aspect of it. For a year, ten, three years, five years, with somebody that's been in the industry for thirty-five years, and like, you know, that's you can't compare. That's why they sound so. That's a great, great point. Well, you know, I there's an engineer I work with. Full, he's a full-time employee, uh, more a business partner than an employee. Mm-hmm. Cariati Suteja, you should get him on here sometime. I'd love to. He, he's phenomenal mix engineer, and uh, you know, without him, my story wouldn't be what it is. I mean, so we've been working side by side for. 22 years so i always have to mention how important what he does on a daily basis is to elevate what i do you know um you know our jobs overlap in so many different ways i love that that is that's a really 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 under talked about but really important point to get people that like can really just better what you do yeah surround yourself sound if you surround yourself with the right people they will elevate you 
yeah. much faster. I mean, yeah. you, you can cut, cut down the amount of time it takes to get to where you need to go yeah. by by 50 percent or more absolutely absolutely double down on your strengths and sub out your weaknesses <laughs> 100 uh, that's amazing i love that i'm super curious now so you've been in the industry for quite some time which is a, a huge accomplishment first of all because like you know with burnout rates or just like how the way the industry changes you oh, know like yeah, to, to stay relevant is amazing so i want to compliment you on that well um, thank you but i'm curious how have you what's the, in your perspective how have you seen uh, in the most drastic ways that the, the industry changed, what are some changes that you've seen, good or bad? Uh, well, there's there's so many. I mean, it's like, well, for like, just as like I could talk for an hour about that, but um, uh. you know, um, just just like the use of say, you know, really nice microphones and mic preamps, for instance. Like, just take that one topic. It's like, you know, back in the '70s and '80s, like the, you know, records cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and there were people around when, with lab coats calibrating things. Yeah. I mean, it was like a, a totally different world. So, you know, records had a certain sound, but a lot had to do with the gear, you know, and that gear is not really accessible to people, um, you know, in general. But now, you know, with all the that, you know, UAD makes all these fantastic plugins that sound just like the hardware. I mean, there's so many amazing technological advancements. That yes, you know, you can achieve that sound with s almost, you know, ninety percent less. Okay, yeah. but the, but but the but the the plugins don't come with the ears or the experience, and that's what's kept me relevant is because you know people come to me not for studio time; they come to me for expertise and, and to collaborate and to try to elevate what they do, you know, on, on a visceral level. It's not; yeah. it's almost it's 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 almost you can't even put it in words really. Yeah. Like when when you connect with an artist and you get them to that place. Where they've always wanted to go and a lot of times that's that's the journey for me is and that's what i get the most fulfillment out of because i've been doing this forever i don't need to impress myself when i work with young people they show me stuff i'm like oh what's that mm. that's and they're like yeah can you do that with my voice i'm like oh i don't know i gotta let me let me study how they did you know how they did that you know because you know there's all these crazy techniques in music especially in pop music uh, that are really really innovative and cool and they annoy some people but i think they're like chopping up the vocals and getting all the porpoise yeah, sounds and all yeah. that i love that stuff you know yeah, and i yeah. i've learned from young people so i like to work with young artists and, and then but then i have to study what they're excited about See, if I study what they're excited about, I grow at the same time. But th but then they're they're going to that place that they haven't been able to get to. So everybody wins. See, I love that, man. That is such an interesting perspective. That is that is really pretty wild. Um, so I'm curious about that because so and and the reason I had such a you know excited look when you said you know you, you, all this gear and stuff, but you don't have the ears. It is word for word. Several t people have said that on these chats, and it's like. Man, confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. So I hope I hope people that are listening hear it. You know what I mean? Because it's it's the truth. You you like even Chris talking about Chris. Like he said that you know he has all this gear, but he uses like Fab Filter and all the stuff that like is super easy to get and super relatively inexpensive. It's like he just has yeah. the ears, but he knows what to do with it. Exactly like, because he spent decades sitting there you know, making tiny movements with it. You know? Absolutely. I love that, man. I, it's so fascinating. Now, for somebody that's worked on, you said 40 hours of stuff, 500, uh, I think you said 500 tracks. Like, Yeah, yeah, five or 600 there. In your experience, you've seen a lot of music. You've worked on a lot of music. Some that had, you know, was very, very elevated at the top of the charts kind of stuff and stuff yeah. that, that wasn't. I'm curious, yeah. wh in your perspective, what's something that makes a hit? Oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah, that's that's something that goes back to like, like the twenties and the thirties, like who knows? It's definitely related to the the environment in the world at the, a specific time. Like that's why music goes through trends. Mm. And you have you know you have the you know, jazz and then bebop and then big band and then you know all that stuff. It's like it's I think it's all it's different for every era, mm -hmm. and it's definitely evolves based on the culture and the taste of mm -hmm. of the people. Like there's stuff like. You know, yeah, it's it, 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 you can't really define it. It's it's yeah, and there's just all these happy accidents that happen, you know. That, but then you know, there's a mixture of like the happy accident, and then the people like Prince who come along and just like everything they do is just like, oh yeah. my god, like, how can one human being do all that? You know. Yeah. So it, it's I don't really know. I I really don't know what that is. It's never been a big concern of mine though. I've always I've always wanted to make music that was compelling, interesting, and took you on a journey. What you know, if it ended up being a hit which it occasionally has um, that, that really hasn't been my forte. It hasn't been my, my focus, um, you know, because it's to me, as soon as you're trying to 
imitate something. That's a great you know, point. By the yeah. time you figure it out <laughs> and get good enough at it to do it, it's in a hairspray commercial. So then you've already missed the boat. So you really have to follow your own path. And a lot of the music I've made, even 15 years ago, it doesn't sound like anything else. So like, I feel like what I do has a long shelf life because I, because I kind of don't pay attention to trends. I kind of, you know, I mean, sure. You know, if the, if an artist wants to go that direction, you know, we'll, you know, and you'll hear that influence, but I don't think it's, it's not, it's not a decision. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, that again, is the like, perfect segue into the next question. That was going to piggyback off of that. Uh, what do you think like makes lasting music? Because there's music that's a massive hit today, or ten years, or whatever the case, massive hits. But then they're only there for for eight months, a year. But then there are songs, you know, even relatively like you want to go back as far as you know, like the you know Frank Sinatra's and stuff, or you the Beatles and and but like even today, like you know, one of my favorite bands is The Fray. Um, I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with them, but like oh, they sure. they came out with their like massive hit albums like 15 years ago. You know, and it's still like How to Save a Life or Over My Head or Cold Place Fix You. Like these songs have been 15, 20 years and they're still on the radio. Yeah, I think, well, a lot of it has to do with the song itself. Never, it doesn't really have anything to do with the production value. Okay. I think it, I think it has, a lot of it has to do with the, the, the way it connects with people in, from a lyrical sense, from a melodic sense. And then there's, there's nostalgia because, you know, when there's, you know, like say when grunge came in and all of a sudden, like, all of a sudden there was Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Soundgarden. It's like all of a sudden, you know, Cinderella and all that other stuff was just kind of overnight, like erased. See, so these trends create these, you know, these eras, yeah. you know, and I, and I really don't know what's going to be next. I feel like it's time for something different. Mm. I really, I feel, I feel like a lot of the, you know, when I first heard auto tune, I was working on a record with Sean Mullins. Um, he had that hit lullaby. I worked with Peter Collins on, that first record and then the second record I produced um, with Sean. And I remember Peter brought in shares. Do you believe? And it was before it was on the radio. He somehow had a copy of it and he said, this vocal effect, it's incredible. We've got to implement it. I think it's going to change pop music. And like, we heard it and we're like, really? I mean, we're like, really? And then we, we had to figure out what it was. And it was a rack mount unit called an Ataris, which was a, a rack mount one space, vocal tune basically and it and if you m messed with the parameters and made things happen too fast and like on chromatic or whatever it would do these those goofy effects and so wow. he wanted he wanted it on this track and the track was sean mullen's shimmer there's it, it occurs two or three times very subtly because we're like no way <laughs> and so so then auto-tune the news came out a few years later like on youtube auto-tune the news i don't know if you remember it but it was mm -hmm. a, it's probably still on there if you google it it's called auto-tune the news and basically they turn the news into pop songs you know with yes auto i've seen videos like that sure uh, yeah so, absolutely and now you jump ahead another 10 years and th that's in pop music and totally acceptable yeah yeah so, so it's been a very long evolution you know and I, I do miss like the character of people singing you know and the imperfections i mean i you know i like autotune and i use it and stuff and it's, for an effect it can be really cool but i think if you use it in a musical way and, and create like somehow capture some humanity in the performance, some emotion, some frailty, things like that are really hard to, to get through that filter because, you know, it's like if you listen to like, you know, a Peter Gabriel song or, a you know, a, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's like there, there's something it filters out a lot of the humanity in it. You yeah, know, so I, I'd like to see more. I mean, I'd like to see more of a trend to, toward towards more human um, vocals. Very interesting you say that because I've been listening to the new Ed Sheeran album that came out today and mm -hmm. I was thinking actually just that in the sense that he obviously doesn't use any auto. I mean, of course he probably pitch corrects like everybody else in the music industry, yeah. but doesn't use auto tune the effect. Um, yeah. Now, but I was listening to it and like, there are parts where I'm like, man, I'm actually really surprised he released it like this. Cause it's the, the, the frailty in the voice, the way his voice cracks, it almost sounds like, like it's super imperfect you know what i mean like it's maybe all, it's great. a key no i know i, I hear you uh, but it, I, I was like wow it's so different than the pop music that we hear today and i i'm sure people are gonna love it because it's so it's i mean it's no different than 40 years ago but it's very different than today yeah it stands out yeah. yes very I mean, much you, so. feel, you feel something and that goes back to what you're yeah. saying what makes something last is is something that makes you feel something you know a deep emotional connection you know 
Yeah, that's a great point because a lot of the stuff today is more like on the surface level kind of, yeah, this is cool to dance to for an hour, but yeah. it doesn't have a deep emotional connection. Absolutely. That's a great point. Lyric actually. Lyrically, like, you know, like take an artist like Joni Mitchell, who's like right up the street here in Laurel Canyon. I mean, the poetry in her music and the, the weird, weird guitar tuning she used and everything um, are just like, it, it, you know, there's nothing like that now. I mean, it's yeah. like, it, it's worth checking out. Yeah. She, I got into a lot of weird guitar tunings because of her records. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I tuned to C and all, all kinds of weird stuff. No, I love that. That's, that's really interesting. So now I want to kind of segue into some of the, the, the stuff you've done for film because you've done some really interesting things. You've worked with Scream. You've worked with uh, Twilight. Um, so can you talk about what you've actually done on those? Sure, shows? sure. On, on Twilight, basically it was because I worked with Collective Soul on a, uh, the song called Tremble for My Beloved. And there was this big soundscape that, that was in the in the, the song. It ended up being a pivotal scene in the movie. So I really kind of by osmosis got into that. My actual film scoring stuff came years later. You know, like I'm doing things now. I've done all kinds of different stuff, you know, like indie films and you know, I just did a horror movie called Warnings that's out. And, you know, so that those that's are cool. those are almost two different careers. Like this, like a lot of that stuff was soundtrack stuff working on with an artist like Collective Soul. I, I worked on the Scream first one. It was a song called She Said. And then uh, Run, we did Run for the uh, Varsity Blues soundtrack. So that's more like soundtrack based stuff. But then I started getting more into the actual composition and, and scoring, you know, uh, worked on, you know, spots, network spots, trailers trailer things mm. all that that's stuff. pretty so, cool yeah. it's constantly i've been reinventing myself for you know a dozen years you know part of the reason have, why you've stayed relevant yeah i mean you re it's really you don't have a choice you know if you want to i have four i have four four kids so it's like i got to figure out how to how to you know keep the cereal flowing <laughs> <laughs> i love that what kind of music are your kids into oh that they're, they're it's funny they're different like my my oldest she's 11 and um She's into like everything, but she's she's a she's a, a, a an incredible classical violinist. She's um wow. she, she's actually first chair of the um, L.A. Youth Symphony. They're going to Carnegie Hall and stuff. Like she's wow. like, it's, it's crazy, and she likes she likes hip hop. She likes classic rock, like you know, everything from Led Zeppelin. But one of her favorite bands is one of my favorite bands, XTC, which uh, is you know I grew up listening to that stuff. So and then my middle son. Um, He's into, you know, he's more into the, the modern pop stuff, but he loves he loves piano oriented music, stuff like that. And then my four year old likes um like stuff that annoys the other kids. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. That is funny. That's amazing. So I, I again want to thank you for your time and I wanna I wanna wrap it up so I don't take too much of it. No, no, um, it's all great. Thanks but, so much for having me. No, it's been a pleasure, man. It's it's been an absolute pleasure. You have your wealth of knowledge. I've you got a lot of a lot of years of experience to share with people. So, speaking on that, I, I want to talk about like for you've met a lot of people and you've worked with a lot of people. I'm curious, and I, I for the people that are listening, how would you recommend when an artist wants to work with another artist? Like, how how do you make these connections and how do you like jump these bridges? Okay, well, um, for me, it's always been just a very weird coincidence. It's like it's being, it's you know, it's it, it, somebody hears something that you've worked on, and then I've found that it's, it's always through the artist. If it, I've never had any luck getting to somebody through a manager mm. or through an agent or through, you know what I mean? It's always the artist who hears something in what you do and goes, hmm, what would that be like, you know? Um, with Collective Soul, they were working on a record at uh, um, what's that place in Miami? Famous, famous studio. Can't think of the, the name of it right now. Um, they changed it to the Hit Factory now, so it's like it used to. Anyway, Criteria. So they were there um, working, and uh, Bob St. John was mixing something. And but one of the records I had done that year was Schizophonic by Nuno Betancourt from Extreme, his first solo record, which I co-produced and co-wrote a bunch of songs on. And it was really like edgy, you know, and for the time. And the lead singer, Ed Roland of Collective Soul, was like a huge fan of that record. And then when Bob said that he knew me, he's like, you know that guy? He's like, well, I'd love to get him on one of our songs, you know? Yeah. So that's how it happened. So I was working on another record up at Longview Farm in, in New England. Um, and they sent me like ADATs. That was, that's what we were using back then. So they sent me like four ADATs and they said, just, you know, put, put down some stuff on there and see if Ed likes it. And I just put a bunch of stuff on there, sent it to him. He said, man, we, 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 we love it, but I can't find the one. 
because <laughs> I have this prog rock nature. I said, no problem. I can, I can straighten it out for you. But that was the, their first impression of me. It's fantastic, but where's the one? <laughs> yeah, I love that, man. That is so funny. But anyway, so that's, that's how that happened. So, and, and with Duran, it was you know, them, him, them hearing a cassette of me doing my performance art. Yeah. It, it's kind of just like, yeah, it's, it's, it's through the artist, I think. I don't think there's, it's, it's very hard to approach like a management or something and get something through, you know? Yeah. It kind of it sounds like it kind of all comes down to just put being yourself and your creativity and kind of putting your creativity out there. And through that, it builds connections of, oh, have you heard this? Oh, so and so does this. And and as you it's it's also kind of like a long patience game to some degree, because like absolutely it's all you met all these people because you met this person and then continued working who knew this person and they continued working. And it's just like yeah. a spider web, but it takes time to build that spider web. There's no shortcut to it. Yeah. But and I, one thing that I have to say is I think kids today in a lot of ways have it a lot tougher than I had because back when I was started working with loops and, and, and sequencing, it, it was fairly like pioneer. It wasn't like, it wasn't like 9 million people could do it in their bedroom. It's like you had to, have a serious investment, like a Lynn drum machine. Like it took me years to pay that back. You know, it was like, there was, it was like, it was like you were, you were all in, but there was hard, there, there was not a million people doing it. Mm. You know what I mean? So, so those who were committed and, and, and super into it had, a, you know, it was easier for us to get recognized because there wasn't 9 million of us doing that. That's so, a really interesting perspective. Cause a lot of people would argue the opposite saying yeah. that because the barrier was so high to entry, that it, it kind of blocked a lot of people. No, I appreciate that as perspective, your perspective, because it, it's very contrary to a lot of people's perspective. And that's yeah, actually I think really me, but just for just for me, you know, for, from my, you know, with the performance art and how how I did that and how that ended up being what connected, you know, um, yeah. So yeah, you could look at it the other way too. No, yeah. but that's that, I appreciate that fresh perspective because so many people would be like, oh, it's so easy for these kids these days. But I I would completely understand how you. You feel that way, and it's a very valid point. I think one of the best things to end on is um, this is the most important thing. Like, if you, if, you're, if I'm scanning through like like a bunch of profiles on Instagram, and I'm listening to people m making beats, you know, and I hear you know the same circada bug trap hi hat and the same distorted 808 for like 50 in a row in the same auto tune thing, it, there's not one compelling sample that makes you go, "Wow, this is cool." When I grew up, the object of the game was to stand out, not to blend in. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes standing out has risks, but the risks are worth taking. If you want to, you know, you want to get noticed, I think you need to take risks and stand out because you're not going to get noticed in a scroll of, of things that all sound the same. That is so, a, that's that's a great that's, perspective. That's, that's my best uh, advice to anybody is don't be afraid to stand out. Yeah. You know? Absolutely, man. I really appreciate your time, man. If you could just hang out for 30 seconds more, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody that did watch this, make it to the end. You guys are the best for making it all the way to the end of this. Go definitely to check out Anthony's stuff everywhere. There'll be links in the description of this video, and I'll, I'll, I'll have ask him for the uh, the Spotify links so you can check out all the stuff. But his Instagram oh, yeah, cool. and everything will also yeah. be in there. But thank you guys so much. Best way to support the channel is by checking out my original music and subscribing to whatever platform you're listening to. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you. God bless Thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye.